Okay, we're going to get started with the first afternoon session. So, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Global Grand Challenges Symposium panel discussion entitled Space in a Galaxy Not So Far Away. Uh, just as a reminder, you've heard this before, this symposium panel is being live streamed and recorded and audience members may be seen and heard in the live streaming and recording. Let me first take this opportunity to again express gratitude to the participants from our Global Hub partner institutions for visiting Cornell campus uh, this week. As we've learned through its absence during the pandemic, there's an invaluable and intangible benefit to all being together here in person to discuss our ideas. In terms of this session, this week we saw the launch of the NASA Artemis I spacecraft, representing the start of a program to return astronauts to the surface of the moon for the first time in half a century. While exciting and historic, this program is estimated to also have cost $25 billion, and each launch costs $2 billion. By comparison, it's anticipated that future commercial heavy rockets may cost less than 1% of that. This year, we've also seen the successful deployment and operation of the world's preeminent space observatory, the James Webb Space Telescope, or JWST. JWST has already created a wealth of spectacular images that we've seen across the international press. And there is palpable excitement among Cornell researchers and other researchers as they get their hands on the JWST data for the first time after what has been for some a 20 plus year wait. In this session today, faculty from Cornell and our partner universities will explore important and timely topics related to our global engagements with outer space, including the opportunities and challenges related to intergovernmental collaboration and space policy, the growth of the commercial private space sector, issues with inequities and barriers to access to space, uh, development of new technologies and materials, and habitability and signatures of life both in our solar system and beyond. Finally, it's also going to cover topics about our conceptualization and visualization of space and our future in it. It is my pleasure to now introduce our six distinguished panelists, faculty from across the arts, humanities, sciences and engineering, whose scholarship is advancing frontiers in the exploration and understanding of space in distinct ways. We'll hear from Jonathan Lunin, chair of the Cornell Department of Astronomy and David C. Duncan, Professor in Physical Sciences, Large Lars Buhaver, Professor of Space Research and Technology, Astrophysics and Atmospheric Physics at the Technical University of Denmark, Anandita Banerjee, Associate Professor of Comparative Literature at Cornell, Mason Peck, the Stephen J. Fujikawa, 77 Professor of Astronaut Astronautical Engineering in the Cornell Sibley School of Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering, and Jaideep Chatterjee, Dean of the Jindal School and Art of Arc and Architecture in the OP Jindal Global University in India, and Liesl Kaltenegger, Director of the Carl Sagan Institute and Associate Professor in Astronomy here at Cornell. So with that, Jonathan, I'd ask you to come to the floor. Thank you, Rachel. This is, um, unfortunately, because of the lights, you can't see it very well, but this is uh, my favorite planetary picture of the year. Um, it's grainy, but it shows uh, a semi-autonomous rover exploring the surface of Mars, photographed from its uh, accompanying drone helicopter that has made uh, log 33 flights as it followed the rover across the surface of Mars. While the world is focused today on uh, the Artemis mission to the moon, returning humans there after a 50-year hiatus of humans in low Earth orbit, and of course this mission, uh, Artemis 1, is uh, not piloted, but the next one will be, Robotic planetary exploration has made steady progress over this 50-year period, going from simple flyby spacecraft to vehicles that orbit, land, fly around, and sample 
all of the planets of the solar system. Those missions have revolutionized our understanding of what planets are like, and they've put the Earth in a different perspective than it was in 50 or 60 years ago in terms of why our planet is habitable, what the evolutionary trajectory of different planets might be, and where there might be places in our own solar system to look for microbial life underneath the icy surfaces of moons in the outer solar system or oceans of salty water where life may exist today. And on the surface of Mars, evidence that three and a half billion years ago, Mars was habitable, that it could have had a biota, it certainly had standing bodies of liquid water, and its evolution as a planet diverged from that of the Earth so that it became, as far as we understand it today, an uninhabitable world. This particular location is on the floor of a crater called Jezero. On the western end of that large crater, three billion years ago, a river breached the wall of the crater and deposited a large river delta, which exists there today. There is no water in it, it is extinct. And the Perseverance rover, which you see here, is sampling material at the base of that delta and collecting and putting that material into tubes. Some of those tubes are being left behind on the crater floor and others are going with Perseverance as it moves on out of the crater with the ultimate aim of returning that material to Earth, a Mars sample return mission. This will be the most ambitious robotic planetary mission ever conducted, in many ways as technologically challenging or more so than the return of humans to the moon with Artemis. And the reason for doing it is that the signs of life and the evidence for uh, how old this river delta is and what kinds of interactions between the water and the rock and possibly biology occurred really can't be adequately analyzed without using the exquisitely sensitive laboratories that we have on planet Earth. One can do some amazing things with analysis uh, inside these robots themselves, but ultimately this material has to be returned to Earth 50 million miles away from, um, away from, uh, from where we are now. That three is a ranking of how my talk is going. And that's out of 10, is that correct? Great, okay. Um, I'm gonna pep it up a bit here. All right, excellent, good. Uh, you know, that's the way it goes. Um, so this is an international endeavor. Uh, the United States is leading Mars sample return, uh, NASA. Europe is building a Mars orbiter that will take the sample capsule that will be delivered into Mars orbit from an ascent vehicle that NASA will put on the surface of Mars in the late 2020s. The sample tubes will be gathered either by Perseverance, if it's still alive, or by uh, robotic helicopter helpers, be loaded into this ascent vehicle, shot off the surface of Mars. The uh, European uh, orbiter will rendezvous with that capsule, uh, engulf it, and then that material will be brought back to the Earth. That's not the only international aspect of Mars exploration. There are six uh, countries or agencies that have operated in and around Mars, and so Mars is truly an international destination in space. But Mars sample return is something entirely different. An independent review board called this mission arguably the most technically difficult and operationally demanding robotic space mission NASA and the European Space Agency have ever undertaken. And as a member of the standing review board for this mission, I can tell you it's one of the most amazing technological missions I've ever had the privilege to review. Nonetheless, the U.S. National Academy of Sciences in its decadal survey this year said that Mars sample return is of fundamental strategic importance to NASA, U.S. leadership in planetary science, and international cooperation and should be completed as rapidly as possible. So where do universities like Cornell fit in? 
A whole raft of issues remain in addition to the technologies. How to handle the samples? Do they have to be sterilized? To what extent should they be sterilized? What facilities will analyze them on the Earth? How will the data be distributed? And this is one component of a planetary exploration program, an international program across the whole solar system where universities have always played key roles in the scientific definition and execution of these missions. At Cornell, from Carl Sagan, uh, involvement in uh, the early Mariner missions and Viking in the mid-1970s to the Mars rover Spirit and Opportunity, uh, led here at Cornell by Professor Steve Squires, to the work done today with these Mars rovers and, and orbiters. Cornell is an exemplar of what universities are doing as part of this exploration program. And so the challenge, in my view, for universities today is how to step up and play as intimate a role in such a technologically large program as Mars Sample Return uh, as they have uh, in simpler planetary missions in the past, and then to use those as a springboard for doing their own independent robotic planetary missions across a remarkable solar system. Thank you. So next up we have Lars Buchheber. Thank you very much and thank you for the invitation to speak here today. So uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, what, in my opinion, what is one of the greatest unanswered questions in science, uh, namely, are we alone in the universe? And remarkably, I think, we're actually uh, at a time where we can reach a conclusion or an answer to this question within our lifetime, which I, I find incredibly exciting. Uh, so basically, uh, by looking for biosignatures, signs of life in the atmospheres of Earth-like planets orbiting other, other stars than our own sun. Um, we've discovered uh, thousands of planets now, and if I were to sort of uh, summarize what the most important discovery over the last 30 years of the exoplanet field is, uh, where the first planets were, were found. It's quite recent, actually, just shy of 30 years ago. It's probably that Earth-sized planets, Earth analogs in the habitable zone where the temperature is just right, are incredibly common. In fact, it may be every second star. So if you point up at the sky and count one, two, that star likely has a planet like the size of the Earth in the habitable zone. And there are 300 billion stars in our Milky Way alone, meaning there are billions and billions of Earth-sized planets in the habitable zone just in our own galaxy. And there's hundreds of billions of galaxies in the universe. So the number of planets is just staggering. And the question is, can life uh, take rise on, on, on all of these, uh, these planets that are similar to the Earth, or at least in size and, and temperature? And so we're really, right now, at an era where we're starting a new era in exoplanets, which really is characterizing and observing the atmospheres of terrestrial planets for the first time. In fact, uh, the James Webb Space Telescope was, was mentioned uh, just earlier, and I have some uh, very, very recent new results uh, I'll show you just to have some real plots and science in this talk as well. But what, it, what the James Webb and the next generation telescopes are going to do is to open up a window to observing the atmospheres and the environments of Earth-sized planets for the first time. So we're really sort of at a crossroad, and we have really very little idea of what these environments of planets around other, other stars are like that are, that are like uh, the size of our own Earth. Uh, so so uh, I mentioned the James Webb Space Telescope, which was launched uh, uh, just after uh, Christmas last year. Uh, this enormous six and a half meter uh, telescope will really uh, allow us to probe the atmospheres of these planets. And then later, uh, it's, uh, you know, extremely large telescopes like the ELT uh, will come online uh, at the end of this uh, this, this uh, decade. Uh, first light in 2027 for the ELT. I put. Uh, a very familiar to Danish people, a round tower. I should have put something else here for this, uh, for this audience, I think. But it's an enormous uh, telescope. Uh, and, and it might allow us to look for, for these biosignatures for the first time in, in terrestrial planets uh, with, with the Andes high-resolution spectrograph that's scheduled for first light in, in 2030. 
so, so there's a bunch of facilities that are coming online which will do this. And this is uh, some results, some very, very recent results. This is uh, one of the first attempts at looking at the atmosphere of a terrestrial planet uh, with JWST. So these are unpublished uh, from our group. Uh, this is a transit when the planet moves in front of the star and, and, and dims the light of the host star a little bit. Now, if there were exoplanet people in the room, they would, they would think that this was a, one of these enormous hot Jupiters that were found very early on because the data quality is so uh, incredibly amazing. I mean, you don't have to question whether there's something happening in, in, this, in this light curve, and this is the planet that's, that's moving in front of the star. And uh, this is one of, of four transits in our program. If, uh, if, uh, the, if the, the atmosphere of this planet has the CO2 atmosphere like Venus, we should be able to detect uh, those signatures in the, in, in, the, in the atmosphere of a terrestrial planet for the first time. Uh, but we don't know whether these planets actually have atmospheres or if they're very cloudy, which will inhibit our uh, possibilities to do so. And I'll show a spectrum, which is what we're looking for uh, of this planet, but with this one single transit, we don't expect to be able to see anything. And we don't, in fact, and that's the first plot up here, that's actually the spectrum of this planet, and it's basically very flat. The, the second panel is, is where the data has been a little bit, and you can see a model which shows how a CO2-dominated atmosphere would look uh, like, and, and you can see that the uncertainties in the data with just one transit, which was, which was expected, is, is too large to do this, but with the, the three additional transits, we should really be able to do so, because uh, James Webb is performing, as we hoped, actually a little better than the exposure time calculator, so the data quality is, is just uh, amazing, and I think we can get ready for an onslaught of, of data coming from this amazing uh, facility in the coming uh, months and years. So, uh, so, so this is basically just having this first window into the atmospheres of Earth-like planets. But if we want to find life, we want to look for biosignatures, so signs of life. And our own atmosphere is, uh, has been completely and radically changed by life on, on the planet Earth. Not by humans, but by uh, photosynthetic life that has produced all the 21% oxygen that we have in our, in our atmosphere. And so uh, if somebody were to look at our atmosphere, we, could, we cannot hide that there's life exists on our planet. Uh, in fact, you would be able to detect uh, CO2, methane, uh, oxygen, water vapor, and so on, and, and infer that there's actually life uh, on our planet. And this is what we want to try to do on other types of planets. Uh, oxygen is uh, uh, Earth-centric, so to speak, biosignature. And Lisa will talk about, I think, other possibilities for, for biosignatures. But this is uh, what really shows that there's life on Earth. And, and to do so, we really need next generation very, very large facilities, even, even uh, more specific than the James Webb Space Telescope. And so uh, it was a, uh, to my great pleasure that both ESA and NASA has put uh, this search for life at the very, very top of, of their priorities. Uh, uh, and, and from the decadal survey, which was mentioned earlier, uh, there's a little snippet of text here that says basically inspired by the, <clears throat> the search for signatures of life on other planets outside the solar system, the recommendation is this very large six meter aperture uh, ultraviolet uh, infrared optical uh, telescope that is slated for perhaps launch in the 20, early 2040s. So, so this will uh, hopefully be able to detect whether there's life on other planets. And ESA has a similar, less, uh, a little bit less ambitious program to, to also go after, after these questions. So I think the, the future is looking extremely bright. Uh, I, I want to uh, end up by saying that uh, you know, maybe the exoplanets uh, science may be driving this question and also the solar system science as we heard earlier, uh, but it's really a very, very multidisciplinary endeavor. Uh, it's not enough to, to do these observations. We really have to understand what we're seeing in the context of the planet, the sources and sinks, the biology, the geobiology, and everything else has to be uh, uh, pulled in. So, so it's, very, it's a very multidisciplinary nature and, and cannot be done by astronomers alone. So let me end by saying that, you know, Earth-like planets are incredibly common. Every single or every second star, maybe, uh, has these planets uh, as you look up into the sky. And these next generation facilities may be able to tell us whether the Earth's uh, biosphere is really uh, a common thing in the universe or it's, it's really quite unique. Uh, and, and as I said, this is really an interdisciplinary endeavor uh, where a lot of different disciplines have to come together to interpret the data. So thanks so much. <clears throat> Thank you, Lars. We'll next hear from Anandita Banerjee. Uh, 
Uh, for me, um, as I was listening to these two illuminating and captivating talks, um, it, uh, two things struck out uh, that feed directly into what I am doing in this illustrious panel. Um, I, I heard over and over again um, speculation uh, being used as a rhetorical tool for communication um, in this room at this podium um, and, and speculation as not just catalyst for technology and science but also as method and epistemology. This is what I study, but not through philosophy. I'm not in the philosophy department. I engage with this through two other things that I, I only have words here. I was noticing the images that functioned as crucial anchors in the last two presentations by my co-panelists. I study um, another word that is related and derived uh, from the same source as image, uh, images, which is imagination. Imagination, whether worked through words, images, or any other really coding system, including mathematics and astronomy. So, so I like uh, to uh, uh, study as a scholar, not just of literature, but also somebody who works with multiple languages that straddle the globe. How could these codes work? How imaginations are constructed? How then what we think of as a passive reflector of actual technoscientific innovation and development, namely fiction, is not a, a passive object that merely reflects some sort of reality, uh, which is outside of the imagination, but can reach out and shape that reality as an active agent, an actor in how we shape the future. So to that end, I start with these two quotes. One is from a very famous science fiction writer, the Canadian William Gibson, who way back in 1989 introduced the word cyberpunk to our global language. <laughs> Uh, the future is already here, it's just unevenly distributed. We heard a lot about this in last night's panel by our representatives from around the globe. This was, the unevenness of the future was a major topic. But I want to add to this a Diné saying, uh, the Diné are the peoples of the southwestern U.S. in the four uh, corners of New Mexico, Arizona, Utah, and Colorado. Um, and the Diné have a saying that you can only have a future that you can first imagine, which is uh, uh, something that inspires uh, this talk and my work in general. Um, so uh, let's see, what is the navigating tool here? So uh, in this continuum of imagination and future and frontier. Um, I want to start by invoking this badge from April 22nd, 1970, the first Earth Day. Uh, save your Earth, you can't get off, which, which is both true and not true, because getting off the, 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 the limits of planet Earth into a frontier on which the future was consistently projected had been a thing in the world for at least 100 years before this badge came into being. So, uh, so the frontier of outer space that we have been talking about, sorry, um, uh -huh, has been in our imaginations long before indeed it became a reality. And to me, the frontiers of the cosmos, as the Russians used to call it, or in the terms that we are discussing here, um, is for me the most interesting field in which to study how we spatialize and materialize time, how we project futures into the frontiers that lie beyond our planet. I was also fascinated to see that these two random visuals that I chose for this presentation corresponded with the two frontiers of material objects in outer space that were invoked again and again and again in the first two presentations, namely the moon and Mars. And in the first, the Soviet postcard, it's a New Year card, the moon is a mine in the second from 2018 in this new retro uh, 
communications campaign by NASA, one of the exoplanets, is visualized as such, which leads me to think of the missing link, which is that, um, which is that where are the humans? Where are we at these frontiers? And these two visuals show us some of the limitations of imagining us. Are we on the moon? Uh, but we cannot imagine the moon beyond a mining site, an extraction zone. Can we not picture li uh, us with life on Mars, not billions of years ago, but in the near future? Uh, but we are bounded by a suburban picket fence. Is that all? Is that it? Then would we not be replicating the exact same things that we are running from, from our planet? So, sorry, I am a. So I take you to no, the last year's Mars landing, which was named Octavia Butler Landing. And Octavia Butler, as those of you who are science fiction fans in this room will know, is a very, very famous science fiction writer of African-American descent. And I want to invoke this uh, epigraph from Octavia Butler's last unfinished book. There's nothing new under the sun. So we may be limited. We may stop at those mines or picket fences. But there are new suns. And this is where I find the value of different kinds of stories, which exist. We don't have to invent them. And I'll leave you with this excerpt from a little piece I wrote, which landed a week before lockdown. Um, well, the Star Wars reference. But perhaps we could look at the second paragraph. What happens to science fiction's premise of what if, as the Anishinaabe critic Gray Stillen reminded us already a decade ago, when for the majority of the planet, the future projected on the space, outer space frontier is it's not something out there and yet to come, but arrived a long while ago and is here to stay for the long term in both its utopian and dystopian apocalyptic and hopeful forms. Perhaps Gerald Weisner's concept of storytelling about frontiers and futures, I would embrace this term, survivance, which is different from survival or sustainability. Survivance, storytelling as an active presence that is more than survival, more than reaction or endurance. So my stakes in this panel are to help us formulate an ethics of the frontiers of the future. Thank you. Thank you, Anandita. Um, next, we'll hear from Mason Peck. Thank you. It's a real honor and a privilege to be among these extraordinary colleagues on this panel today. Um, I'm looking forward to this. One of the things that sets me apart, I guess, and sets me at odds with my chosen profession is that I like surprises. Uh, I, I enjoy the unexpected. And you appreciate for an engineer, uh, the, that's sort of anathema to what we, uh, to our stock and trade, right? When things work well, particularly in the context of aerospace, it's because we've thought of all the contingencies. We've planned out the mission procedures. Uh, we know what's supposed to happen, and it does happen. And I guess we get a warm, frothy feeling as a result of that. But uh, there's a different kind of feeling that arises when I encounter a surprise. Uh, Rachel's introductory remarks struck an important tone uh, in that respect, and that's that this is a time of change. Uh, surprise, in fact, in particular, was the reason why in uh, the late 1950s, uh, after October 1958 specifically, the nation started two organizations. One was the Advanced Research Projects Agency, now we call that DARPA, the acronym now adds a D for defense, uh, whose purpose was to prevent technological surprise. And the technological surprise of interest at that time was Sputnik, the first artificial satellite to orbit the Earth. Uh, we have tried not to become surprised like that as a nation since then. Uh, the other institution, of course, is NASA, which started out a few months later. Um, NASA took on a different mission. Uh, at the core of NASA's um, Space Act, the act that founded NASA is uh, to educate and inspire. And uh, my association with NASA over the years has been uh, of particular um, interest to me because of exactly that. So it's a time of change, and it's change that actually is so fast that it's hard for us to keep up. For close to a generation, in fact, we've relied on 
one particular aspect of space technology to, um, to provide innovation, and that's small scale. Uh, those of you who have been following to some extent how space has been unrolling over the last uh, 10, 20 years uh, will have heard of CubeSats, very small spacecraft, about 10 by 10 by 10 centimeters, a kilogram of mass, so a, a liter of spacecraft, if you like. Um, that idea, that construct, has made it possible for students, including students at Cornell, to put their senior project into space, for startup companies to create small telescopes that image the Earth for science and other purposes. Uh, it's enabled new technologies, partly because of the rapid refresh possible when you're not devoting decades to a single multi-billion dollar spacecraft. So small has meant innovative for a long time, and for as long as I've been at Cornell, in fact. Uh, they, these CubeSats, they're now the most frequently launched type of spacecraft, not the most massive. You know, there's, uh, I think all the CubeSats ever built wouldn't add up to a single James Webb Space Telescope. Uh, but they have lowered barriers to entry into low Earth orbit and beyond. They've enabled commercial approaches uh, and they've made spacecraft into commodities. So we've produced at Cornell and elsewhere a generation of students who expect space to be like that to be easy and fast, to be simple, to be accessible, to be democratic. Uh, and that's not what they encounter when they take that first job. They encounter something entirely different. Um, the reason that CubeSats and other small spacecraft work this way is that their total life cycle cost, how much it costs to design, build, test, launch, and, and finally dispose of these things, it's tens to hundreds of thousands of dollars. It's a lot of money. It's more than I have with me right now. Uh, so it's expensive per kilogram, but it's still within reach of these small companies uh, with a university research lab, certainly. But we're at the dawn of a new era, a surprise. That surprise takes the form of the SpaceX Starship. This is a launch vehicle capable of launching more than the SLS rocket that will take Artemis, uh, par parts of Project Artemis, to the moon. Um, it can do, it launch more mass, 150 metric tons, so 150,000 kilograms to low Earth orbit, and can do so for, my spies tell me, on the order of maybe $10 million, maybe half that. That is absolutely a game changer. Um, with that opportunity comes the chance to rethink what spacecraft are, particularly those that NASA would consider so-called flagship missions like the James Webb Space Telescope. Um, like large aperture telescopes. If you had available to you the means to launch something like James Webb, but for $10 million, what would you do differently? You would probably, and thanks to the size of spaceship, uh, Starship, you would probably launch a single monolithic mirror. You'd probably create a structure out of material like uh, INVAR, which is a, a, a nickel uh, metal, uh, sorry, nickel iron alloy uh, that doesn't change shape with temperature, and a lot of other little engineering tricks that you could use to make it a really simple, really quick, uh, and accessible mission. Uh, allowing us to do more science, not less because of lower cost, but more by virtue of lower cost. Um, there are more, there's more to say about just what that would look like and what that future holds, but this lower cost launch services and hardware sounds like kind of a, you know, kind of a grimy question. How, what does, who cares? You're so, someone saving some money, right? It allows us to overcome failures simply by launching inexpensive replacements. And we're coming up in a time when the exotic materials of which we build spacecraft aren't going to be those extraordinary results of, you know, decades of academic research, but Honestly, stuff like leftover bits of metal that are already in space, maybe rocks and sand and mud and bricks. And I'm not exaggerating because that means we would be using the material from the lunar surface or from asteroids, in situ resources they're called. In a future where we can make spacecraft that don't need to launch, where they are unrestricted by mass and cost so little that virtually any of us could participate in space, whether that's scientific or commercial activities, what do those spacecraft look like? These questions completely upend my discipline and introduce surprises uh, left and right. The students uh, at Cornell in the next 20 years uh, will not learn how to design uh, very precisely uh, calibrated uh, exotic materials. Uh, they will not uh, check every single line of code in the flight software. They'll put it in space and maybe it'll work, maybe it won't, and we'll go fix it. Or we'll try it out. Doesn't work, we'll bring it back to Earth and launch it again. All of that completely flies in the face of what we take aerospace engineering to, uh, to be about. Uh, 
That's the kind of surprise uh, I anticipate, if you can anticipate surprises. And Adita will correct me that you can't anticipate surprises semantically. Uh, <laughs> but um, in that future, uh, what will we see? We will see infrastructure in space. We will see the ability to call home with a, with a smartphone from Mars. So you won't get lost and need to grow your own potatoes on Mars someday. Uh, and all sorts of things we can't even imagine. So yes, this is speculation. Um, at the same time, it's almost here. So I look forward to that new future with you guys. Thank you, Mason. Next up is Jaideep Chatterjee. Um. Uh, a very good afternoon to everyone, and thank you to the entire Cornell Hubs team and Grand Challenges team for organizing this symposium and the Hubs meet. Uh, the last two days have been a wonderful experience, not only sort of returning back to my alma mater, but also meeting colleagues from all over the world who are so invested in the project of globalizing education and knowledge. Um, each panel has given us much food for thought, and I know I and my colleagues from the OP General Global University are so much the richer for it. Finally, thank you also for putting me on part of this panel on a topic which is rather close to my heart and a chance to be with colleagues from the sciences because what I want to say as someone from the humanities, social sciences and design backgrounds um, owes much to how they talk about space. Um, I want to begin by making a rather bold statement, somewhat blasphemous statement. Um, it has been my contention for a while that unlike the natural sciences, humanities and social sciences, and by extension, much of how we understand the everyday world, what we call our intersubjective world, our intersubjective space, has never really tackled the problem of space. We have never really theorized this question of space. All our efforts have been through the, towards the radical interpretation of time, of temporality never spatiality. <clears throat> in terms of this temporal uh, reinterpretation, I'm thinking of intellectual genealogies, which perhaps begin with Hegel, and make its way down to Marx, Lefebvre. I know geographers are going to get angry at me, but I, I, I stand my ground. Or even parallel trajectories um, from Dewey, Husserl, Bergson, Heidegger down its way to Derrida, post-colonial studies, and, and, and their reinterpretation of history. Um, there are perhaps many reasons for this. Um, the ecclesiastical scholar Raimundo Paniker has noted that perhaps this has much to do with Western epistemologies um, being unable to reconcile the rift between what he calls the inner space, chit akasha in Sanskrit, with akasha, um, the, the outer space uh, since Descartes. Right? Um, now, this non reconciliation uh, and its consequent under theorization uh, and neglect, especially within the humanities, the social sciences, design, architecture, planning, um, has meant that we continue to look at this every day, um, this, what the philosopher Heidegger calls the worldhood of the world, uh, through Cartesian categories. Let me take, for example, some of the words and ideas that have surfaced through our meetings since yesterday. Mobility, area studies, regions, nations, disciplines, interdisciplinarity, climate, environment. Each of them, I will contend, is actually undergirded with a rather simplistic understanding of space. Let's take the nation. This resurgence of this nation, its understanding of its territory as contiguous of what is inside the nation versus what is outside this nation. Uh, this extends to the ideas of the borders, always understood as a circumscribing a contiguous territory, a space. Contiguity here is itself physical contiguity, where physical is again understood through 19th century understanding of cadastral mappings. Uh, <clears throat> let's take the university, disciplines, interdisciplinarity. All of these to fall back on some topoi, right? A topoi which is again understood through this kind of an understanding of space. So disciplines and curricula have cores, they have peripheries, they have insides, they have outsides. And we fight about all of this realizing that they are part of the same ideological framework, right? This very simplistic understanding of space. Let us take environment. What do we mean when we say we, uh, we have an environment. Is it the same thing when I say I have a car? 
uh, is the environment again some bounded entity which is an outside and in inside? All right. So how do we deal with this issue? Uh, here, I think fortunately, the digital techno-social revolution for the first time is actually bringing into sharp relief our fundamental humanity, which I believe is partiality, right? Which is not betrayed by terms such as borders, cores, peripheries, insides, outsides, regions. Uh, <clears throat> of course, this is where uh, precisely the challenge comes. Now, just a few weeks ago, um, there was a report that was released which asked the question, is the global decline in democracy linked to social media? Now, interestingly, the question itself falls back on this Cartesian spatiality that is in which, uh, th that credits democracy as if democracy is a unified, contiguous terrain, a bounded terrain, an area which can be measured, which can therefore be colonized by other forms of thinking which are equally bounded, equally contiguous, and equally a, a kind of this area-based based terrain. But there is another point I want to make here. Uh, the authors conclude that the answer to this question has been both positive and negative, right? It has positive and negative e effects. On the positive side, they note, that it has led to greater engagement, greater diversity, et cetera, et cetera. On the negative side, they note that the main effects has been a, a, a kind of a reduced trust in institutions. Now, what is interesting here, and, and this is what I would really like to end with, is that for the positive, right, we rely on our everyday experiences, on that intersubjective space, right, uh, which has nothing Descartesian about it. We, we, we do that. But for the negative, however, we constantly and always fall back on an understanding of the social, of the media, of institution, whether this be law, democracy, universities, what have you, through understanding them as spaces and areas governed by some strange idea of this Cartesian space. This, I believe, is the biggest challenge of our time and something that needs radical rethinking. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jaideep. OK, our final speaker will be Lisa Kaltenegger. So what I would like to do is I would like to bring us back to the idea of why space. Because to be honest, to me at least, and you've heard from my esteemed colleagues before, space is a human adventure. But it's not just an adventure. Because we do understand that there is a climate change and then there's a point of no return because we looked at Venus. Carl Sagan at Cornell, that was his PhD thesis, trying to figure out why Venus is the hell planet that we see. We couldn't understand that. CO2 and climate change was understood a while ago. I, I understand these discussions. But Venus gave us the information that, we are, that there is a point of no return. And by looking at other planets, we could take that to safeguard our own. The same for Mars. We understand that any nuclear weapon we would ever ignite would get us to a global winter because we see how on Mars, sand and thus in the atmosphere actually cools the surface and would basically distribute disaster all over our own world. It brought people again together to talk about that it's kind of ludicrous that we have these weapons in the first place. So let me just give you the different take on why space. Two billion years ago, and I promise I'll get to the beautiful, we will find, we are at the stage where we could find out if we are alone in the universe, a question that have been it has been 2,000 years old, at least in written form, might have been older. But we now 
that about two billion years ago here on our planet, life has changed our world completely. It made oxygen, microbes. It killed 95% of all the life that was there because single cellular organisms did not realize what they were doing. We do. And so I think one of the things that looking at space and trying to find other worlds, trying to find other worlds that might have life on it, also teaches us, because we're modeling these worlds, is that yes, we are changing our planet, but maybe at a certain point, that's what life does. The key point is that we have to fix it to the extent so we can survive, because as multicellular organisms, we actually can do that. And because we looked at space for such a long time already, we have the knowledge how a rocky planet works. Now, if we find a rocky world out there, and Lars was telling us one out of two, and I applaud his optimism, and it's true. So we know one out of five stars out there have a planet at the right distance, not too hot and not too cold, and, too sm and small enough to potentially be in Earth. And as Lars was telling you before, there are, as we hear at Cal Sagan University, we're going with, there are billions and billions, that was never said as a quote by Carl Sagan, of course, of potential worlds out there. But it is humankind's adventure, us finding new worlds. And I just wanted to very shortly introduce the Carl Sagan Institute here at Cornell. We have 35 faculty from 15 different departments. So yes, what you would expect, right, to try to understand a planet, it's going to be physics, it's going to be astronomy, it's going to be geophysics, it's going to be engineering, biology. But we also have science communication, performing arts, literature. We just got a new common person who's not on it. And you see one, two, three people on the panel uh, from the Carl Sagan Institute. So there is a part for everyone to play. But not just here at Cornell, this is just where we built our first center. And so we are creating a toolkit to find life in the universe. So every fifth star might have a world like ours. And so we will understand our planet so much better by just looking at those as well, understanding Earth. And light and matter interact. So Einstein showed this a long time ago. If light, light has energy, hits a molecule with the right energy, that molecule will start to rotate and swing. Thus, the light that filters through the air of the planet and gets to my telescope will have missing pieces. Those missing pieces tell me what the atmosphere for the planets is made of. This is that view for our own solar system, for its moons and its planets. And you can think about each rocky planet as having a light fingerprint, like each human having a fingerprint that tells you who that person is specifically. But I told you about how we changing our planet. I told you about how life has changed our planet. And so when you look at the life or the Earth, 4.6 billion years, it's a 24 hour clock. Around 3 a.m., life actually started on our planet. And around lunchtime, oxygen started to build up. And that generates this light fingerprint. And this is how that would look like for our telescopes. And don't look at the details, but this is Earth right now. This is Earth when it was really young. And you see that the change in the light, the change in the air, changes the fingerprint of light. And so we have, for the first time, the telescope here in the back, the James Webb Space Telescope, to look for them. And again, even so, it's an American telescope, at least perceived to be American, it's an international endeavor. Uh, Europe was part of it, other space agencies were part of it, but the people who made this telescope are from all over the world. And the scientists who can use the data, even if you don't PIing it, 
the data will go into an archive and everybody can use it. But let me take one last fun part I hope you like. So life on Earth, right? We're thinking about the pale blue dot. But what about different kinds of life that we don't think about so much? Here on the side is, for example, extremophile. It's a water bear that survives pretty much everything. So as we are from so many different corners of this planet, I hope you think of your favorite colorful biota, moss, microbiology, whatever you want, because we're generating a color catalog of life here at Cornell, free for everybody online. So if you have in your backyard or anywhere close to your backyard some nice colorful biota, then as a global endeavor, we could just all measure that together so people who look for life on other worlds could actually find it. And so again, as just one tiny thing of what we could all do together, is something that doesn't require as much funding, for example, but that actually will bring science so much forward. And how would we use it? And that's the last slide I have. Let's assume this was a work we did on life in ice. Uh, for some of you who live in places where there's actually ice, you know that some of the ice is colorful. Biota can survive and thrive in ice. So if we were to go to one of the icy moons, or if we find an iced over planet, somewhere else. There is life that could strive there. We don't usually think about it, but if we put our global hat together, it's just one possibility. We could probably make a huge database of what that would look like to our telescopes and use that to together do humanity's adventure of trying to figure out if we're alone in the universe or not. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to each of our speakers. We're now going to open up the discussion to your questions and thoughts. Please put your hands up and uh, people will bring microphones to you. I know it's tough after lunch. <laughs> yeah. Stunned silence. Yes. Well, maybe, oh, no, nope. got a couple of questions. Um, Kenny Nguyen, Office of Global Learning. Uh, I think this is sort of an overarching uh, question I have and maybe your thoughts on it. Um, there was a comment on like the science fiction of say Star Trek and how the idea of technology being socialized in a way and that allowed it was whether it's technologically driven or really it's society driven, like we have to become that before that technology will be that. In the sense of, as we build technology now with ownership in mind, then it's always going to be sort of used or owned or, or maybe misused in a way that's not going to be collective or socialized in the way that we imagine the future. And I guess to the extent, how do we build our community in such a way that as we explore space and go forward into space, we are going to, build ourselves culturally to be more collective and collaborative and, and towards that, that greater future that often we see in like Star Trek or other ideas of, you know, food security and everything that, that comes with that. Thank you. Anandita, Jaydeep, do you want to take a start with them? So this is my job apparently to identify who should speak and put you on the spot. Yeah, well, I did raise those questions and those questions are important to me um, because they always, um, I'm gonna answer with a story. And so I grew up, a long, long time ago in galaxies far, far away before the coronavirus put us in lockdown, I published a, a book. And in the introduction of the book for the first time, I spoke about my life, which um, academics are kind of not allowed to talk about being autobiographical. But there I could not help being autobiographical. I started with the story by recalling a poem that I still, I grew up in, you know, those back, uh, analog times when we actually had an oral tradition of children reciting little poems in the playground. And this was, as I discovered, an intergenerational poem about 
uh, look up and there are two moons in the sky which by the open, uh, way is the opening of Samuel Delaney's Dahlgren. There are two moons in the sky and that's Samuel Delaney is another very famous African-American science fiction writer and philosopher who is still around. Um, so two moons in the sky, we did not read Samuel Delaney. The two moons in the sky as it turned out in that poem was one's the old one, the other one is Russian, and look at all three of them, and then there's a third one, and so on it went. I don't remember the exact numbers, but the point is the two were Sputnik 1 and Sputnik 2, which were moon plus two. This was our parents' oral tradition, which obviously filtered down. Um, why I say this is I'm struck by the archives that we do have, both scientific in the, and in a material sense that, for instance, Lisa, you were talking about. Um, in some ways, you know, the, this data is also a transtemporal set of a glimpse into outer space, right? So the spatialization of time for me is very, a very important part of the story. What I do want to point out is where I was growing up was actually an, um, uh, an extractivist sacrifice, sacrificial zone. I grew up in coal country, which seems really old, except that it's still there. It's still in play. It's real. It was real back then. It remains real. Maybe even beyond Trump digs coal and many other parts of the, it's, it's not that we've gotten rid of coal, right? Um, but uh, to me, this is fascinating. This is, when I look backwards, this is for me a crucial moment because that was a democratized moment, right? We hadn't launched those moons. Sure, those Russians had, and pretty soon the Americans would too, and so forth, and there was the space race. Um, that began, you know, when my parents were in college, maybe. Uh, but it had this profound emotional impact and uh, it created a set of relations with the world, okay. even though we were not actors. Thank you, thank you. So, yeah. Okay. And next question, yes, thank you. Uh, this is a basic question, but, and Rachel, you, you touched on this, I think, but do you see the private sector, for, for reasons of technological advancement or cost savings or whatever, slowly moving more and more into this area and NASA taking a smaller role, perhaps more on the edges of technological developments. But basically, the private sector start moving more and more into it, NASA becoming more of a smaller entity. Because the cost, the numbers you threw out were uh, pretty astronomical uh, in differences. And taxpayers are aware of these things, and they're wondering why. You know? mm -hmm. I mean, there are questions of why do we spend all this money on the moon and Mars, et cetera. Uh, so I'm just curious, is the private sector versus the government in this area and shrinking, expanding, pushing things out or what? Jonathan and then Mason, if that's okay. So f first off, I think we should put some of these numbers in perspective. So $25 billion was also the cost to develop the Boeing 787, and that's a subsonic jetliner. So when we say that these numbers are astronomical for developing lunar missions and so on, they're actually very typical for aerospace projects, even ones that are done by private companies. Now, the value proposition for a subsonic jetliner is very different. You're going to sell 1,000 copies of them. But nonetheless, development costs are not out of bed with that. In my particular area, I would say that uh, private uh, industry, uh, of course, has always built aspects of planetary spacecraft, instruments, and so forth. But the novel thing that's happened is that uh, with companies like SpaceX, the cost of launching those planetary missions is going down. So Europa Clipper, which is the next really big planetary mission to the outer solar system, uh, will be launched on a Falcon Heavy, which will cost, uh, for the launch, $225 million. Um, the equivalent launch of Cassini to Saturn, which was on a government launch vehicle, a Titan IV Centaur, was $400 million in 1997, which today, someone do the inflation calculation, probably be $500 or $600 million. So private industry is bringing the cost of launching spacecraft down. And as Mason said, there could be some even more dramatic, radical, decreases, and that will help us 
to do more activity in space. Mason, do you like that? Well, what we do in space science, uh, in my view, I think the view of most of us, is the appropriate domain of a national scale uh, funding resource like, like NASA. NASA is our nation's uh, space science program. Uh, there's the European Space Agency, of course, the Japanese Space Agency for their respective countries. Undertaking those kinds of missions seems appropriate at the national scale. But there's something else at stake for, let's say, a company who's interested in uh, creating some infrastructure, some, uh, uh, you know, some intellectual property uh, from which it can uh, make a buck. And that's different. That's uh, what's of relevance to a company. I think for, the, for, uh, for private enterprise, whether we're talking about larger companies or even startups, uh, the scale of investment has to be uh, you know, appropriate for a company to afford. Even the largest companies, oil companies, uh, couldn't afford the kinds of things we're talking about. Although it's true, for a lot of oil companies, their monthly profit is similar in scale to the cost of the space station. But that's you know, a comparison I'm not making a political point on. I'm just offering that there are occasionally large enough companies to afford that sort of thing. But they do do that because that's not the kind of work that they do. Uh, that change, that paradigm shift that I, that I mentioned, um, is going to lead to companies doing things in space we haven't seen. I don't think it's a shift of what are our priorities. Uh, it's more. In other words, it's not either or. It's an and. We're about to see uh, companies, for example, manufacturing in space. Space as an industrial park or business park or something like this. An example is Varda Space Industries. It's a company uh, started, by the way, by some Cornellians. Um, they're going to be manufacturing things that include fiber optic cable in space. It turns out that uh, the type that they can produce is called ZBLAN, ZBLAN, um, is so much more transmissive than what we use on the Earth right now and that we could create on the Earth that uh, you could eliminate all the little repeaters that exist in fiber optic cable across the nation and, and use a single piece of fiber optic cable uh, to connect both ends of the country. A as an example, that is so valuable that it's worth the cost of launch at today's prices to fabricate this and bring it back down to the earth. Imagine how profitable that will be in the future that's almost upon us when launch costs drop by a factor of 10 to 100. Uh, so that's the change that we see. We see companies able to launch small telescopes. I referred to this earlier, a company called Planet Labs, been around for over 10 years now, uh, that's doing space imagery thanks to the accessibility that small spacecraft bring. So there are plenty of other activities that go on in space. And I don't think the only ones are the, let's say, the large scale flagship missions. It, but I, I strongly uh, believe in and support the idea that we as a nation, we as a, as a world, should take on these large scale missions. Uh, if we don't do this collectively, it won't be done. Thank you. Wendy? Thank you so much for that panel. It was fantastic. Um, I mean, I think my silence, at least, or the difficulty coming up with questions is partly that the science is so far over my head um, that it's hard to know how to, um, you know, how to engage with it. Um, I'm very uh, earthbound. Um, but I have a couple of questions, and I'd love to hear your answers. They made, they're coming from a, a very different place, obviously. The first one, you know, Mason, you said that there were reasons why private companies would be interested, but we should still support the big flagship missions. And I believe that. I'm convinced. I find it fascinating what we could find. But I'm wondering what the government agencies are thinking they might find by financing these. Yes, knowledge. Um, and in a university, we really believe in the value of knowledge. But I remember talking to a colleague who was submitting a proposal to the NIH, and he said, well, you basically have to say you're going to cure cancer. Even if it's not really a, a cancer-related project, they want to know that there's going to be some kind of, right? So I'm wondering, in, from your perspective, other than knowledge, which is key, um, what do you think the government funding agencies are really hoping that you might find that we might be able to do with the, with the work that you're pulling in. And the second question um, is just about policy um, and space policy. And I think, not that this is comparable exactly, but I work in Southern Africa. And I, of course, always think back to 
1884, 1885, when a group of 14 nations had sort of a set of maps in front of them and were thinking about how the so-called superpowers at the time were going to, in a really enlightened way, divide up the map of, of Africa with new exploration, right? And so I just wonder, um, that was uh, intended for, yes, of course, exploration and extraction, but also the idea was that it would be done in collaboration, but the collaboration was those 14 nations who were at the table, right, for that conference, um, the Berlin-Congo conference. So I'm just wondering, in terms of policy, Will the policy for how we think about who benefits and who claims space, will that be post hoc? And if it is post hoc, what are the dangers of potential, um, you know, for either that life, I don't know, that we might find, those were very cute organisms, um, or for our own um, uh, very unequal uh, population here on Earth? Thank you. I'm going to ask if. Lisa, Lars, or Jaidi might like to answer this. Um, which one we're going to answer first? Okay. Um, I think uh, also a little bit to the first question. Uh, I I think that for scientists who are doing this at the university level, uh, if you're doing, uh, if you're very good in programming, you could be doing something else that would give you a much a bigger salary, right? However, I find most of my colleagues up to a certain point are idealists. They wanna, for example, let's say astronomy for our case, they wanna find life in the universe for, for my specific case. And I think this is not limited to any one country. And we getting incredibly enthusiastic people from all over the world to come here to Cornell, and I'm sure you're getting enthusiastic people everywhere, you know, at your universities as well, that want to cure cancer, that want to find life, that are actually, that these big goals of human humankind speaks to them. And I think the more we have those people on the table, getting to your policy question, right, they, they are not completely separated from um, from the people who make the policies. You know, now I'm, I'm being optimistic, right? I completely understand that there are a lot of geopolitical constraints, you know, who gets the money, who puts this on a table. But what I mentioned before, the James Webb Space Telescope, that was really expensive, right? And so the people who actually built part of the telescope and who built part of the instrumentation get the first data. And we have a proprietary period so for six or 12 months where we can do whatever, we, you know, where we have to analyze the data. But after that, it's free for anyone in the whole world. That means that something that at least in astronomy and in a lot, I think in a lot of science is starting to become the norm because the people we have do absolutely realize that we have an inequality of knowledge, especially as we were talking about last, yesterday, right? And I think as long as it's pure science we're talking about, maybe not curing cancer, but pure science with maybe not as much application, so astronomy would fall into that category, it might be easier to break down these silos in these limits between the different places because there's not so much economic gain you can get from this pure knowledge. And so I come back to the question you were saying. So knowledge in itself, as we all very much agree, is. Uh, is uh, worth it in itself. How do we change the way that we frame that knowledge? Who can access it? And for us, and I think it might be a bit subservient, uh, astronomers, we have, for example, in astronomy, and then I'll let my colleagues talk, we have what we called um, uh, a pre-paper server. So yes, we're paying for the magazines, we're paying to get things published, the magazines do this stuff, but we have on the site, and the magazines know that, but we just basically don't talk about it, and it's actually located here at Cornell for Astronomy, this is uh, the AstroPH, the archives, where everyone, pretty much everyone in my field, will put their scientific work in, and it has no pay border. Everyone in the world who has an internet access from anywhere in the world can access it and build their work on top of ours. Because science needs everyone we can name. And so I think we are influencing that structure because we have ways around limits that 
put in place, right? Or they're, they're hierarchical or historical. And I think many more scientific uh, teams do that. And going back to the first question, how do we evolve that we actually uh, become a Star Trek or something, civilization? How do we evolve where we respect each other? And I think education and working with people from different countries, as we are here in the room, right? Once you've seen a person as just another person happens to be from there, happens to look like this, I think this is how we, that's the only chance, how we break down these prehistoric or the, these preconceived notions and bring everyone back to the table. And again, this is incredibly idealistic, right? But we are university conference, so I think we are allowed to be idealistic because, I'm going back to what you said, if we cannot imagine, it's paraphrasing, we can, oh no, I have this actually. You can only have a future that you can first imagine. Let's imagine a good one. Um, thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to try and take the second question. See, I, I think your question raises precisely the point I'm trying to make. When we'll think of policy, we'll think of this colonization. We'll think as if space is some kind of flat map that we can colonize at, at some level, right? I think it goes back to what Lisa just said. Um, so the policymaker will think that, oh, here's the space I will colonize, but that's not really the space that we are talking about at some level. I, I, we have to stop thinking of space in that manner. So, you know, I can, I can think of multiple. Why, why the space outside? Let's take the space of the internet. Let's, let's take the space of social media. All of these spaces, right? Uh, a policy will try to say, okay, I can control it. But just now we heard an example where there's another element which comes in to disrupt that that kind of colonization. Because the policy is not taken into account that this is not flat cadastral space. It's not, right? And that intersubjective space, that's what I want, I'm interested in constantly, right? Which evades this kind of, it constantly evades it, right? And I'm thankful it evades it in, in that sense. I, I don't know if that gets to it. But again, it's, it's, I'm optimist in, the, I'm an optimist in that manner. Thank you. Uh, we actually have a couple of questions um, online, so I'm going to ask one of those and then come back to the room. Uh, so the question is, we have witnessed with our own planet the reduction of resources and rising heat and the hard strides towards sustainability so as to not reach complete planetary depletion. Are there strides and practices in mind as we continue with these discoveries and plans for habitation where planetary sustainability is paramount, not only for humans but for other bioorganisms? Lisa? Uh, and I'll give... I'll, does, yeah, anybody else are happy to defer to? Okay, good. Lisa, please. I think the point that I was trying to make is that it's very much on our forefront of thinking because once you start to model a planet, right, trying to find signs of life on another world like ours, you figure out, you know, that the winds go everywhere, that this whole thing is connected, there are no borders, right? That's what we notice with climate change, for example. And you're starting to understand that this is one completely combined world. And so everyone that I know that is modeling this, this is the first things that's on our mind. And if you talk about space exploration, whether it's Mars or it's Moon, you would have to be the perfect recycler on Mars or on the Moon because you don't have the resources we have here. So trying to develop such systems for the Mars and for the Moon actually help us. And we would not have to develop these systems for the Earth because we do not have yet these tight constraints on our resources. But being able to actually develop it for space exploration forces us to see what we could do, like in an extreme, terrible environment, you know, Mars, Moon, anywhere on Earth is better than that in terms of survivability. And so in a very, very long run, it's the last point I wanted to make for this question, think about a perfect future. And this is now going into science fiction where we, and Mason mentioned this already with the cables in space, right? Where the industry and its pollution is in space, in the forgiving, not good for us, but in the forgiving space where you could pollute, you shouldn't pollute everything, but you know, there's a huge space. You could, if you could take everything away from the earth, we recycle effectively here, and we do the pollution not on our planet. We have this oasis of an earth, right? That would be our perfect future in a way. And it is incentivized by our striving to go to other places 
where we just have to be better with our resources. And then hopefully with the costs coming down to go into space, an opportunity to bring these pollutant things that we would like to have and also bring other resources in from the asteroid belt from anywhere or just become perfect in recycling like you would have to be on Mars or the moon to survive and strive. So that is how I think this search for other planets and our understanding of other worlds actually links in extremely well with trying to keep our own place habitable. Thank you, Lisa. Okay, we've got a question over here and then one at the front here. Yes. I just wanted to um, bring together a few of the images that the panel has, has discussed and in a way it's building on Wendy's earlier question. But so Mason laid out for us the visual image of this fiber optic cable in space but your limits of where that fiber optic cable were, were delimited by the Cartesian map that Jaideep mentioned, right? So in, your, in the example that you gave us, it was from one coast of the United States to another. And that to me brings up the image of the picket fences that Anandita um, shared with us, right? So when we talk about technological innovation or potentially this idealistic utopian world that we could imagine, in space or, or through using our knowledge of space, we're often thinking about innovation, potential for leapfrogging, right? Moving behind other types of limited connectivity in the fiber optics that we currently use. But how are we bound by our Cartesian understanding of space or our picket fences that we construct or imagine or live around? And how could we go beyond them in in imagining kind of new futures that would use space in a way to escape these boundaries. Thank you. Okay, who would who would like to take that yeah, on? I, 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 Mason. No, I, 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 um, I'm just going to. No, I agree with what you just said. It will complete. I, I wanted to ask. Uh, Mason, the same question that 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 cable was still bound by uh, sort of the, this Cartesian understanding. But see, this is interesting, right? I mean, where is the metaverse? I want to ask. Is it out there or in, inside us? This is something I've been struggling with constantly. We put on these glasses, and where is that space that I'm 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 going into? Right? Do I actually go into it, or does it go into me? I I don't know at this point. Of time, I have, I have absolutely no idea. But to me, that's just radically questioning this distinction between what what I said was Raimondo Panikkar's idea of this chit akasha, this space that is inside us, and akasha, the space that is constantly outside of us. And I think therein lies some very revolutionary potentials for us to, 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 to. Preventing us from doing a, doing that, and I think, again, I come at this from an anthropological background. I think maybe allowing for different terms, like like the term I use, chitaka, these may be interesting ways for us to reconfigure our own imagination at at some level. And I think that's where a lot of theorization has to happen. We are going on using the same words, and, and, and words are important because they are circumscribing how we are imagining what we are thinking of. Um, the same words that are constantly, they, they keep pulling us back into it. So maybe a new language somehow. And sometimes I'm, I'm very hopeful of how I see my students use language on, on, on WhatsApp and things like that, and how they talk about, about, about being in places. They slip in and out out of this kind of a binary that that I know I use constantly. So they are the kind of spaces uh, I think I would like to pay some attention to and, and, and figure out. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you. I've got another question. It's a different tag. Sorry. How? Yes. You. No. I'm going to actually. We're going to go here and then I'm going to ask one online. Yes. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you very much. It's been absolutely fascinating. Um, you know, my primary training is in economics, and economics has always had a physics in me. And so if you do economics, you then sort of think about what physicists have done, not that you do physics. And then it strikes you that um, they've all had um, 
people like you have always had a philosophical perspective. Um, and that's what I'd like to tease out. I mean, you know, um, Jaideep referred to uh, Chitta Akasha and Akasha. There's, you know, Yatha Andanda, Tatha Pindanda is another yes. way of saying the same thing, that, that the macrocosm is He's like the, the microcosm. And then in Tamil poetry, you have the interior, uh, Aham and Puram. So, you be, so in all of these ways of connecting things, there's always this thing. So my, I'm fascinated by what you think. Is there consciousness? Is there God? Uh, some, when you go home and finish your great work in astrophysics and uh, astronomy, philosophically, what do you make of, uh, of the world? And um, so if you have a personal perspective on that, um, I'd be very grateful to hear that. <laughs> very good. Thank you for picking me for that one. That was oh, that's an easy one. <laughs> well, I don't know. I've, I'll say this. I, it's, there's a, many things you can answer to that question, but I think one of uh, I, I, I believe there would be in history a point before we knew there's life elsewhere in the universe and after. And I think that will have profound implications on the way we think of ourselves. If, if we find that there's basically no life in the universe, that means our planet is excruciatingly unique, right? Because there's billions of these planets. If life has taken hold on none of them, that means our Earth is very, very, even more special. And we have to take even better care of it, I guess. <laughs> but on the other hand, we might also find that life thrives everywhere in the universe. And that, I think, will have implications on the way we think of ourselves. May I add something? Um, Philosophically, I think that we need to move beyond uh, this um, ontological discussion of space uh, to uh, space is not a thing, right, or a being towards, um, well, first of all, crafting new languages, which was indeed uh, uh, my shared um, objective with what Jadeep said. But also, uh, might we start thinking about space as a set of relations? So that the point of my rambling story at the beginning about the three moons was that it set up a set of relations with things and beings and times and spaces that had nothing to do with our experience only. And it strikes me as really interesting in the internationalist tone, historically speaking, in which we are having this conversation. So this is how, you know, the first joint space station people used to talk way back when, if you look at the archives. We are um, being utopian, but it's a good thing. So that brings me to the question, second question online. Um, I'll just say that from my perspective, coming back to Wendy's question, um, the scale of the investment that you need to make in space missions requires international collaboration, both from a financial perspective, but both from, also from an intellectual and just sheer amount of effort perspective. So the number of humans that need to be involved. Um, and so for one way, rather than our terrestrial human needs, we are all collaborating on something that is more ethereal and has a common but sort of philosophical purpose. And that's a rarity, right? However, and I'll go to our question now, there are practical implications for this. So the question is, says, thanks first for your interesting presentations and conversation. I am curious to what extent panelists think that international space collaboration is a liability for an individual country in the case of a future world war. Sorry to be a, bring it down from the utopian ideals, but I do think it's helpful to consider these questions. Yes, please, Jonathan. Okay. Well, we're seeing that, of course, with the International Space Station and Russia's involvement, where Russia says they're going to pull out. But I see international cooperation in space as a way of reducing the likelihood of these international conflicts, although we can't eliminate them, obviously. And one area that we have not mentioned uh, in terms of space is using space to understand our planet better in terms of global warming. In order to understand the carbon budget, being able to observe from Earth orbit is very important. And nations are collaborating with each other, and this is an area where nations with smaller space programs can play a big role. So yes, there's always a risk that international conflicts will damage 
or sever collaborations in space, but collaborations in space can reduce the likelihood that those kinds of conflicts will occur. Thank you. Does anybody else want to comment on that? Yes, one final question, I think. Thank you. I thank you very much uh, for this uh, really fascinating panel. I am a lawyer and a law professor so far away from science. Um, one of the things that uh, this panel has done is to bring in you know, scientists and physicists and astronomers and to have uh, some people who work in the field of humanity. So my question is that from a pedagogical standpoint, to what extent humanities is actually infused into the study of hard sciences, including, for example, astronomy and physics, because uh, there has been a growing debate around the world to what extent science and humanities should be doing things together. There's a very interesting edited book, which uh, the title of it is something like uh, Great Minds Don't Think Alike. And uh, very interestingly, it has brought together a, a range of scientists as well as people who work in the variety of fields of humanities to talk in a civic discourse standpoint from each their own disciplines. While a conference of this kind has brought all of you together, but to what extent this actually enters into the classroom, into the very foundations of teaching, especially with regard to sciences where humanities actually matter? Thank you. I think we've got one minute to answer. <laughs> Lisa, you're up. I think I want to say that uh, the Carl Sagan Institute has 15 different departments, right? And uh, they're humanities, they're science, there's engineering. Uh, it took us a while to learn each other's language. I think that's the key first point. But I think once you've learned each other's language, all of a sudden you can actually talk to each other and then you can unfold a much more compelling story. And that story itself helps you ask what are the questions. And I think science often is hindered by the problematic in communicating why it's important, why we as humanity need to do science. Like a lot of people is like, why do we have to put money into space, right? Why are we doing this? Why are we doing that? And so I think it's critical that in different places, whether it's you know Global Cornell, whether it's the Carl Sagan Institute, we develop this common vocabulary because if not, we're having a conversation without actually understanding each other, and that's when disaster strikes because then science cannot communicate why this and this is important and what kind of political implication, for example, it needs to have or humanitarian uh, implication it needs to have. So I think small centers that are taking these steps to try and align language or align understanding, it doesn't have to be language, are critical. And universities, especially globally, are key to actually make that happen. Thank you very much, Lisa. What a wonderful closing to the session. Thank you to all the panelists. Thank you so much for being willing to take the question. And thank you for the excellent questions today.